Hi, we're going to take a look at the new Siglent SSA 3021X Spectrum Analyzer. It's a 9 kilohertz to 2.1 gig spectrum analyzer. Low cost. How low cost? 1600 US dollars for the uh, base model unit. And it has a tracking generator option, uh, software option, which is only $169. So we're looking at uh, 70, you know, around about $1750 for a 2.1 gig spectrum analyzer with tracking generator. Brilliant. But hey, that's not quite as cheap as the Rigol uh, DSA 815, which has been out for a, oh, probably a couple of years now. And this has been the benchmark uh, bang per buck spectrum analyzer on the market. Basically, nothing could, could touch it until this uh, signet came along. So this video is basically going to be uh, comparing the uh, two of these. The Rigol is cheaper at uh, $1,200 US uh, with the tracking generator uh, software option for $200. So it's $1,500 uh, for the base unit compared to $1,750 here, but this is only a 1.5 gig bandwidth uh, model. This one is 2.1 gig upgradable, software upgradable to 3 gig, whereas the DSA 815 is, I don't believe, software upgradable 3 gig. You've got to buy the higher model unit from the get-go. Now, if you saw my interview with uh, the Siglent CEO uh, when he was here in the lab, he mentioned that they were about to release the SSA uh, 3000 Spectrum Analyzer, but they had to actually, they did release it, but then they had to sort of, you know, do some last minute tweaks on the thing. I believe they changed the front end on it. Um, that's the word anyway. I don't have absolute confirmation of what was changed, but they had a, just a little performance issue, which they had to fix. That's why it's been delayed until now. And uh, thanks to Charles at uh, Trio Test, I've got the first one that's landed in the country here. I only have it on loan for a few days. I only have it for a short amount of time. So unfortunately, this won't be a full in-depth review of this thing because to review a Spectrum Analyze, they've got so much functionality, so much performance in them. It's like, it'd be a two or three hour video to go over and test everything. It'd take many, many days to shoot. And so anyway, I thought, it's more worthy uh, rather than do a full independent review just to compare these two as a comparison video. So let's go. And the Siglent's actually bigger and uh, heavier than the Rigol 4.3 versus, sorry, 4.6 versus 4.3 kilos. Uh, the feet are all right, no problems whatsoever. It's not going to slide around. Um, fairly heavy beast. But uh, yeah, the quality of the plastics and the general feel and look of it is just a little bit cheaper than the Rigol. The Rigol is just a slightly more polished uh, unit. And if we have a look at the back here, we've got external uh, 10 megahertz reference in, we've got the 10 megahertz reference out, we've got the trigger in, and we've got the LAN all standard. Fantastic uh, fan noise on the thing. Probably on par with the Rigol. They're both kind of annoying but the I think the Siglent is possibly a little bit quieter or the noise is spread over it it's 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 not as annoying let's just say it's a different sort of spectrum pun intended oh I forgot the uh, USB uh, host as well and the Rigol identical it's almost as if they've copied it <coughs> and the boot time between the two come on You can do it. Let's go. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Jeez, come on, Siglent. You've got to be kidding me. Let's go. Well, I'm young. There we go. Check this out. This is the most remarkable thing about the Siglent is that it's a complete user interface ripoff of the Rigol, and this is not the first time we've seen this from uh, Siglent. i probably show you another example after this. One minor difference is that the Rigol has uh, seven menu options and the Siglent has eight here, different, and it's got like a, uh, a, a button to go to, through to a second menu here on the Rigol. But the menu options, look at this, they're practically identical. Go into the frequency of each one, okay? Look! It's practically almost identical. The Rigol has uh, usually like maybe an option or two uh, more, but there, look, there's no difference. If we go into the span, look, um, this span actually, the Siglent has an X scale uh, log axis uh, here, which is quite nice on the span menu. The Rigol doesn't uh, have that here, but they're exactly the same. 
Amplitude, let's go in here and have a look. Rigol has an auto scale up here, but uh, yeah, the uh, Siglent has like an auto uh, tune button here. But apart from that, look at that. A reference level was the same, attenuator. The Rigol, you've actually got to go into the second menu here to get the preamp off and on, which is really kind of annoying. I much prefer the Siglent that it actually has the preamp right here on the main menu, but it's like, pretty much the same. But Rigol, a few more options. He's got 75 ohm input impedance for video uh, staff corrections and like, you know, just a couple of more options. But apart from that, they've tried to rip it off. Go into the bandwidth menu here, um, the, the resolution bandwidth. And look, VBW average type. Okay, detector type is here, which is uh, uh, different because the Rigol combines the uh, bandwidth and the detector, whereas the Siglent actually has a detector menu here, which is, you know, slightly different. But apart from that, like the wording's the same or the positions are almost always the same. It's got EMI uh, filter type as well for uh, pre-compliance EMI uh, testing and things like that. Sweep mode here. Uh, is speed and accuracy mode, normal accuracy, sweep time, uh, continuous number of samples, auto sweep, like... Oh. Go into the marker menu here. It, um, it works basically exactly the same thing. It's got the four markers like this. And, then, you know, it might be an option or two extra on the uh, Rigol occasionally. But, you know, you go into the marker function. It works exactly uh, the same as the Rigol. Uh, the trace function, for example, works exactly the same. The trace mode is really handy. But the Siglin actually has four uh, traces on here, which is pretty handy. The Rigol only has three. But it actually works exactly exactly the same way how you actually set it up. A little bit uh, complicated, so if you've learnt how the Rigol works, you can go straight over to the Siglin, L or vice versa, and just use either one. So from that aspect, it's, it's brilliant. Okay, copy away. All spectrum analyzers should have the same interface. At least it's standardized. There's a couple of differences in the measurement menu, which I'll go through, but uh, the Rigol sort of like puts it in a buried menu, whereas it's just all available here on the main screen on the Siglet, which I find better, but there's a few more options on the Rigol. On the system menu here, once again, the Rigol has, uh, you know, a few more options and things like that. Very similar, like it's got like a uh, demo uh, board, for example, which is quite nice. You can actually buy the uh, demo for that, and that's really quite uh, jazzy. And um, oh, it's not showing up on my screen here. Sorry, I had like a uh, screen angle problem here. I was viewing the Rigol from slightly down, and if it's, you know, viewed slightly down, you can't see the screen. So anyway, that's quite jazzy. That's for like a uh, RF uh, demo board you can buy for it. Speaking of which, both the Rigol and the Siglent have similar sort of poor issues looking up at an angle at the screen. So if you've got it up on a high bench or something like that, not the best. And there's the same for the Siglent. And that's, yeah, there is a reflection issue there. But uh, yeah, you start to not be able to see the uh, graticule and things like that at the lower angle. But you bring it up to the higher angle, well, straight on, and it's just fine. And the higher angle is just fine on both of them. Sorry about the crappy camera work there. And from a key layout point of view, the Siglent, very similar to the Rigol. The Rigol's got like help and print over here and some uh, preset uh, stuff, whereas that's uh, more, you know, over here. I don't like having it over here. I like having everything on one side. So I think from that point of view, the layout of the Siglent is better. The screen just goes right over there. None of this keys on the other side rubbish. But you'll notice that there's significant differences in the uh, status here. The Rigol's very, uh, you know, funky with like little icons and things like that show the current status, whether or not you've got your preamp uh, turned on and what uh, detector mode and, you know, everything you're uh, using, what sweep mode you're in. And the Siglent just has real bare bones text down here. So it's just, it's not nearly as uh, refined as the Rigol. But if I line the start of the uh, displays up here like this, you can see that the uh, Siglent is far superior. It's got, even though it's the same number of divisions, everything else, it's got a bigger, more usable display than the Rigol. But hey, it's a physically bigger scope. You can physically see the size difference comparison there. And both scopes have the same dicky soft power button that barely lights up. And it stays on when you turn the thing off, which is really annoying. It's got USB, which is great for uh, powering, uh, like, you know, H-field probes or other stuff or output speakers because it's got a headphone monitor output, so you can actually have some powered speakers there. So, you know, practically a rip-off of the Rigol.
The maximum input for the tracking gen source on the uh, Siglent here, exactly the same as the Rigol, but the RF input, uh, 50 volts DC maximum is the same, but the maximum input power is plus 30 dBm on the Siglent, and it's only plus uh, 20 dBm on the Rigol. And the demodulation options on the uh, Siglent, I like how it has it all on one menu, as I've mentioned before. Whereas the Rigol, you've got to actually go in here and then choose the menu and then go in and do it separately, which is, you know, rather annoying. So let's check the performance differences between the two. I've got no signal in, it's uh, not terminated, it makes no difference, trust me, whether it's terminated or unterminated, it's bugger all difference. Let's measure the noise floor between these things. I've got the Rigol and the Siglent, identical settings between the bo uh, both, the same detector, uh, the attenuation is set to 0 dB, the same reference point, and I've used the uh, trace mode here to get three resol uh, resolution bandwidths of 1 megahertz, 100 kilohertz and 10 kilohertz on all three. The color coding is exactly the same because they're identical uh, user interfaces, which is very handy. And for uh, a 1.5 gig span, even though the signal's capable of going to 2.1 gig, let's just do the same 1.5 gig span here. And at one megahertz RBW here, we're talking 65 dBm, and we're talking 85 on the signal here. Clear winner, a good 20 dB better noise floor. And then, uh, uh, the difference here isn't as large as the Rigol when you switch down to 100 kilohertz, but we're talking 75 dBm there. We're talking minus 90 uh, down here. That's minus 70 up there as well. And we're talking minus 85 dBm and minus 100 down here. So 15 to 20 dB better noise floor. Uh, the uh, the Siglent is just, uh, you know, it blows away the Rigol, no question. And you'll notice that the Rigol's not uh, completely flat across that 1.5 gig range at about 750 meg. It tends to rise a bit like this, and we don't see that on the Siglent. Look at that, it's much flatter over the range, although if you put this to 2.1 gig, it does actually tend to rise to more towards that uh, 2 gig range. But over the same 1.5 gig range, the Siglent has a flatter response. And if we do the exact same thing, but with the uh, pre-amplifier turned on, that's what PA is there and PA is here. So we've got uh, minus 90 and minus 100, uh, 102 or something there. So, you know, a good 10 plus dB better on the Siglent, minus 100 minus 108, you know, we're getting like a good 10 dB, not as much of a difference as we got without the pre-amplifier off, but uh, anyway, RBW of 10 kilohertz, minus 120, minus 110 or less, so a good 10 to 20 dB at least better pre-amplifier on or off. Brilliant work, Siglent. I tell you what, I do like this little uh, bar graph along the bottom here for the Siglent, works very nicely. And with resolution band with the one kilohertz on both of them, we're looking at about uh, minus 108 on the Siglent and about minus 95 on the Rigol. And the Rigol, when you, I chose auto uh, sweep time for this, it was uh, going to do 1500 seconds, uh, whereas the Siglent was going to do about 243. So I've manually set the Rigol to a uh, 250 second uh, sweep time there. Up until this point, we've been operating over the same 1.5 gig range that the uh, Rigol is capable of doing, but this one's capable of higher, of course, 2.1 gig in this model, or uh, three uh, over 3 gig in the higher up up model, but we've got 2.1 gig, so we've got the full span, and you'll see it rises a little bit there, but, you know, not a huge deal. It's still absolutely beats the pants off the Rigol. I've got the uh, preamp turned on, that's what uh, PA uh, stands there for, stands for, and I'm in FFT uh, mode, by the way, this is what uh, the Rigol doesn't have. It doesn't have a sweep mode between FFT and you can put it in sweep as well, or you can just leave it in auto. Now if I go in here and change my span to one megahertz, let's go right in on this puppy. Here we go. Now, it will, you'll notice that it's uh, telling us we're in FFT mode over here. Okay, so we'll be able to see the difference between FFT and sweep. You'll notice how fast it's updating in FFT mode like that. If we set to auto, it's going to choose FFT in this particular case based on all the current settings. But if we go into traditional sweep mode, there's your traditional sweep mode. We've got more detail in there, okay, for the same resolution bandwidth. Uh, where's our resolution bandwidth? Our, uh, I haven't changed it, it's still 10 kilohertz, so it's quite wide. But you get more detail in there, but it's slower update in traditional sweep. 
Um, so yeah, choose your poison. That's very nice to be able to uh, select that difference. Fantastic. And of course we can just go in there and change our bandwidth. Uh, let's change it to one kilohertz. I, um, by the way, all the controls are quite uh, responsive. You see it did hiccup when we went into the menu there, but you know, no worries. So now, bingo, we're in there and it's slower of course because we've got a higher, uh, a smaller resolution bandwidth uh, figure. And well, it can go all the way down to 10 hertz. Let's see. Uh, it's going to be pretty slow, but check this out. Look at our noise floor. Minus 140, I don't know, two or something. Thank you very much for playing. So this is, the performance of this thing is really quite impressive. And we're measuring a minus 110 dBm signal here. So this will take some time. Now, the 10 hertz resolution bandwidth is an order of magnitude better than the 100 hertz minimum on the Rigol, so there's just no contest there at all. Now what I did here is I just snuck in a minus 130 dBm signal, so <laughs> there you go, it, that can easily get that out of the noise, no problems whatsoever, very impressive. And sure enough, on the Rigol, nah, nothing, I'm feeding in that same minus 130 dBm signal, wah. And I'll show you an example of the resolution bandwidth on the Siglent. We can get it uh, down to 10 hertz. It's 100 hertz minimum on the Rigol, so an order of magnitude better. And I've just set up uh, four different RBWs here for a minus uh, 70 dBm uh, one gig signal here. So this is uh, ten, the green one here with all the detail is uh, 10 hertz resolution bandwidth. The blue one is 30 hertz resolution bandwidth, which you can't get on the Rigol as well. The purple one here is the 100 hertz resolution bandwidth, which is the minimum you'll be able to get on the Rigol. And the yellow one here is a horrible one kilohertz RBW, so you can't see any signal detail in there at all, and I won't explain uh, RBW, but it has an effect on the resolution of what uh, you can get. So you can see that for a given span that we've got here, the 10 kilohertz, by the way, I've got the preamp uh, turned on and I've got 20 uh, averages turned on for the uh, trace mode as well. So on the green one here, you can see that we've got all this extra detail in here we won't get on the other ones and I can actually uh, blank that one now so there we go and the blue one we didn't we've got some detail in there that we can see which is really good that's the 30 hertz resolution uh, bandwidth on the blue one but the purple one there's bugger all on the purple one so if I blank that blue one look you know you can't there's maybe something in there. there's a bit of a dick and balls happening there but you know, you can't really get any detail down on the balls. But if you compare that to the Rigol here, not only is the noise floor uh, worse, of course, as we've seen before, but uh, the best we can get is 100 hertz resolution bandwidth. So we can't get in there and see all the detail. Sure, we can set our span and go in, but that's not the point. The resolution bandwidth of the Siglent is 10 hertz compared to 100 hertz on the Rigol. And this uh, purple one here, I've just set to uh, 300 hertz there. So the one kilohertz, 300 hertz and 100 hertz. So once again, the signal beats it. You can't, you know, that 10 hertz resolution bandwidth could be worth the price of emission on its own. What I've got now is my Rubidium frequency standard from the CSIRO. It's an absolute bobby dazzler. I've got that uh, fed into my Marconi 2023 uh, signal, RF signal generator, and we'll have a look at how accurate the frequency uh, well, the internal oscillator is in the Rigol. Let's take a look. I'm at uh, I'm generating 1.05 gig uh, signal just because, and I've got a five kilohertz span on there, so you can see that it's off by uh, one kilohertz there. So let's take that out, plug it into the siglent. What do we get? Wow, that's much closer. Check that out. I mean, we can go to a span of uh, one kilohertz there. And what a Bobby Dazzler! Look at that. That's only out by, um, uh, you know, 100 and, 130 hertz or thereabouts. Much better. But of course, that's just one sample here. But the clock in the Siglent is actually specified a lot better. Siglent actually go to the trouble to give you a decent spec. Uh, like like a full, you know, a proper spec on the oscillator inside this thing. So I have, you know, a fairly good confidence it's going to be better than what's in the Rigol. I've just tweaked the frequency so it's bang in the center there just because we can. It's, uh, oh, there you go. I can show you. 
That's the frequency. <laughs> there we go. Bang on. Anyway, um, an impressive um, amount of measurement options. We can do channel power, occupy bandwidth, all sorts of stuff. But spectrum monitor, I'm really interested in that. So let's have a look at this. We get this waterfall, beautiful waterfall display building up here. And we can actually see any uh, change in the any uh, jitter or phase noise in the uh, internal clock because we know we're feeding in a pretty high quality stable clock into this thing. I'd have to get the exact specs for the phase noise of the Marconi generator and the rubidium standard and everything else. But anyway, it's going to be pretty good. And then we can build up and, and get a map of our... Um, uh, to see any... Uh, uh, deviation in this thing. I might have to go in uh, closer actually because I don't think we're going to see a damn thing there. And in terms of the uh, measurement setup here, there are um, significant differences between the two. The Rigol actually has more stuff, but it does not have a spectrum monitor display like the uh, Siglin does, and I love the spectrum monitor display. So we've got harmonic distortion on the Rigol, which we don't have on the uh, Siglin. So the only two things the Siglin doesn't have, which the Rigol has, is... Uh... Uh, CN ratio, which is the carrier to noise uh, ratio, how important that is to you, meh. And uh, the EBW as well, which is the same as the occupied uh, bandwidth, except it allows you, EBW allows you to do it over uh, two separate uh, points. But that's the only thing missing, but you get the uh, spectrum, you get the beautiful spectrum monitor display, which can't be beat. Anyway, I've gone into a 100 hertz span down here, and I could leave it going for longer, but there's... I can't see any drama with the internal clock in this thing at, you know, at face value here. So, yeah, that's <laughs> certainly a pass. Not sure as you can see a tiny little amount of shift in there. Just a little uh, something just happened there. Maybe I was, I don't know, was I <laughs> farting halfway across the room or something? I don't know. Now, one of the most important specs on a spectrum analyzer is the phase noise, uh, and this is generated by the internal clock, basically. So uh, we need to know how good this internal clock is. And to do this, um, it's going to be a combination of both the internal clock in the instrument and the signal that we feed in. So we have to feed in a pretty good signal, and I'm going to actually feed it in from my Rigol uh, DG4000 series function gen here. And uh, the reason I'm using this is because it has a very good specified low phase noise clock. It's minus 115 uh, dBc. And here's the uh, spec for the thing. So I'm going to use a uh, 10 megahertz reference here, 0 dBm. I'm going to feed that in. So basically it should not contribute much, if anything, it'll be negligible uh, compared to the spectrum analyzer itself. Now the phase noise is measured uh, as an offset from the carrier. So we've got a 10 megahertz carrier here and uh, we're going to use the specification of 10 kilohertz offset from this. Now unfortunately the Siglent doesn't actually specify the phase noise at 10 megahertz. It only specifies it at 1 gig, which is uh, 95, minus 95 uh, dBc, which is relative to the uh, carrier. And um, as you can see, it's got around about minus uh, 100 um, dBm, which is because it's a zero dBm signal, that's effectively dBc. So minus 100 dBc. Um, so it ma it meets that spec at 10 megahertz. At one gig, um, it also meets the spec, by the way, I have measured it, but then it, the source becomes unknown and it's different. Anyway, that's a an excellent response. Check that out. So the way I've measured this is I've just uh, set a reference uh, marker on the carrier here, and then I've gone into the uh, marker function and we can choose the noise marker and that gives us the uh, power spectral density which is effectively the uh, phase noise here. So at, at a 10 kilohertz offset you can see that number one point there. So it's just measuring the offset there but that is very clean. There's no extra spurs. I'm at 100 uh, hertz resolution uh, bandwidth here. I'm doing uh, 20 averages just to uh, clean it up. And for the detector type here it'll automatically select uh, the video average. I've just got uh, 20 averages uh, set there just to uh, and clean that up a bit, but that is an excellent response. Look, there's nothing in there whatsoever. But anyway, I'm going to use the exact same settings now on the Rigol, and we'll be able to see the difference. And look at the Rigol. This is exactly the same settings. Everything's set up the same. The span, 30 kilohertz. The reference uh, carrier. The uh, detector is uh, set up the same. The resolution bandwidth. Everything's exactly the same. But the response 
is pretty horrible. Look at this. If we go into uh, go back into the marker function here, and we're getting minus 87 uh, dB, which is dBc relative to the uh, carrier here. I've got the same offset marker at uh, 10 kilohertz, and. Uh, you'll notice that, you know, this big slope in here, this is adding extra spectral noise in here, so the clock isn't as good. That's essentially what this display is showing. This extra noise in here is due to the clock. We're feeding in exactly the same uh, signal as we did in the siglent, and, and the siglent went right down here and flat, basically. So all this extra spectral power in here is being added by the crappy clock inside the Rigol. And look, there's a couple of little couple of little side spurs in there. Look at those. Jeez. So this shows a significant different uh, clock spectral result between, or difference, between the Rigol and the Siglent. The Siglent has a much better clock. So here's the comparison. I just shifted the Rigol up a bit so it has the same uh, 0 dBm uh, reference level there. And no contest whatsoever. Look at this. The uh, Siglent's round about minus 80 and is flat as attack until we get to the carrier here. And look, look at all this extra, this slope on here, all this extra area under there is extra uh, noise density, extra basically noise in the clock that the Rigol has compared to the Siglent. And check this out because the Siglent is much lower noise internal clock. Look, we're actually able to see a couple of little spurs there. They would be due to the Rigol DG4000 reference source. That's not. That's coming from the carrier. That's not coming from the internal uh, clock there. So very interesting. But because our Siglent has a much better resolution bandwidth, we can go 10 hertz resolution bandwidth and actually get some detail in there. Here we go. It's going to start averaging a little bit. Nice. It's going to drop the noise floor, of course. That's what the resolution bandwidth can do. And once again, if we go back to the uh, marker function, there we go, minus 98. But we can just get a bit more detail. And oh, where's the other little spur there? Anyway, that's an excellent result. But in any case, the Rigol does meet its spec of uh, minus 80. We're actually getting in about minus 87, so it is better than its spec. But that response there, that shows that the internal PLL in this thing isn't nearly as good. Not only the clock, but also the PLL as well. So it's a bit of the reference oscillator in there, plus the PLL doing all this. And check this out. I think I found a bug. Um, I just realized that I wasn't using the delta marker here. I thought I had set it up. You may have, uh, if you were keen, you may have noticed that uh, before on the Siglin here. And if I set up the delta marker, 10 kilohertz, we're not getting, even though where our marker function is, our noise marker like this is supposed to give our units per hertz. Our power spectral density hasn't got the correct units. Whereas on the uh, Rigo, it will it will do precisely that. It'll, as you saw in the previous clip, it'll work for the Delta marker. And the usability of these scopes, they're practically copied identical function, but it, it doesn't work for a Delta. What's going on? It, it's gotta be a, it's gotta be a bug, surely. So I can go in there and set it manually with the uh, cursor. I'm using the cursor, you can see it move across there. But I didn't do that before. I didn't, I was, thought I was using the delta, but I missed that it wasn't actually, it was showing up. And, it, and of course you get the correct power spectral density here. But what, like, uh, what, I, I don't know. It, it does, it should work the same as the Rigol. Exactly the same, showing delta marker, but it doesn't. Anyway, our figure is correct because we've got a zero dBm uh, carrier. So everything's fine in this case, but yeah, I, bug. And in case you're wondering, is this a PLL thing inside this or is it the reference oscillator itself? Well, I fed in my external uh, rubidium frequency standard into this thing and we're basically getting the exact same uh, response. So all this extra uh, spectral noise in here is got to be due to the PLL inside this thing. But of course you'll notice that there's no little uh, spurs either side of there. So it's actually a cleaner uh, reference oscillator. And if we feed in a 1 gig minus 100 uh, dBm signal, amplitude modulated 10% uh, at 1 kilohertz. We've got a span of uh, 10 kilohertz there with our resolution bandwidth, of course, because we can, uh, down at 10 hertz. And you can easily see the sidebands there. Plug exactly the same thing into the Rigol and yeah, you can kind of see it, but not the same detail because a resolution bandwidth, 100 hertz, 
noise floor isn't as good. You might be wondering, what are these lumpy bits here and here? Well, I don't know offhand, so let's just disconnect the input and uh, see if they go away. Oh, we're going to have to uh, do our clear right. There we go. Back to our average. And they're gone. So are they a function of the input? I don't know. For this particular case, I'm using my Rigol uh, DSG815. But check this out. Look, we can still pick this up. <laughs> going to, look at this. Bring it close. It's just the, just the coupling of that. If we take it right away, actually, this is interesting. I thought it was just maybe the close coupling to that. Um, but the fact is, let me actually turn the, uh, turn the RF off on the Rigol, and no, it's still there. So we're picking it up, we're picking up the one gig signal coming from the Rigol. I mean, I'll, I'll switch it off, okay? We can still see it there. Let's switch it off. Come on. No, it's still there. What the? So check that out. Let me terminate the input. I mean, I've got no other one gig signal happening here. And we'll go to uh, clear right. And then, no, it's still there. It is still, what? It's got to be coming internally to this thing. Although I do have the Rigol turned on directly above it. Let's switch the Rigol off. And nope. The only other thing I've got turned on is my... Uh, Rubidium frequency standard, but that's got nothing to do with one gig. So what the? Nope, I turned off my Rubidium frequency standard. It's still there. Let's go and change the span to one megahertz and uh, see what we get. This could take a while. Actually, I changed it to 100 kilohertz and no, it's still there at one gig. That's very interesting. Some, there's some coupling internal, although you know we're right down in the noise floor, but you can still pick it up. So a little bit of an issue there, precisely at one gig. I've changed my detector type to video and bingo, we're gone at, uh, the, at, at one megahertz uh, span here. So that's really interesting. But turn positive peak back on and uh, we'll see if it comes back. Yeah, bingo, there it is. Turn our video bandwidth filter off, and it, sure enough, it's there. You can still see it above the higher noise floor for the one megahertz uh, span there. And if we set our center frequency to uh, two gig, then at just over two gig, we're getting something there. I was actually getting a decent uh, spike there before, so that's very interesting. Now, if we set it to, say, 500 megahertz, you know, nah, there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing really there at all. It's all hunky-dory. But 1.5 gig center frequency, we have some funny business going on there. And it's not like I've got the tracking gen turned on or anything like that. I've got nothing else switched on around it. It's just the terminated input. And so it's got to be coming from inside. It's got to be coming from the PLL inside. There's a little bit of coupling through to the front end. That's certainly something to be aware of if you're uh, really playing around in the noise floor of this thing. Okay, I'm not sure whether or not this is a pebcac or not, but if I go into the span and just go back, try and do full span, sweep time is out of range. And uh, the sweep time is currently set to auto. So um, it's not letting me go anything above uh, one megahertz span, uh, regardless of if I change the uh, frequency or not. I, you know, 500 megahertz and span, full span. What, like, what's going on? Sweep time's out of range. What does that mean? I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I've got my sweep mode set to auto. That shouldn't matter a rat's. Um, so, I, what? What? Oh, maybe if I turn the marker off here. Is that going to uh, solve my problems? No. No. What the? What the photon? And if I try and change the resolution bandwidth here, it's telling me RBW out of range, the minimum RBW is 30 kilohertz when the tracking gen is open. What's that got to do with anything? So I'm buggered if I can get back into this thing. Like, doesn't matter what I do. Um, maybe someone can confirm this as a bug, but that's what I'm going to put it down to until... 
proven that I'm an idiot and just don't know how to use this thing. I mean, come on. What? What? I can change my center frequency, but I can't change my span. You kidding me? Getting desperate. Let's press auto tune. Yeah, let's play some tunes. What's it doing? There we go. Okay, we're in like Flynn. All right, full span. There we go. We're back. All right, that fixed it, but yeah, I don't know. But of course, if you uh, set the span to 100 megahertz like I am here, the noise floor and the RBW could probably go down, but it's still not going to get down to where we could uh, see that internal uh, coupling or whatever's happening there. So yeah, it's only a problem when you zoom right in at those particular frequencies. And if we try out the help menu here with the button, it's pretty uh, spartan, but hey, it's basically what it says in the manual pretty much. Like if we use the trace mode here, which is quite a difficult uh, and non-intuitive mode to use, in my opinion anyway, to get exactly the result uh, you want, which uh, you've seen uh, me do previously in this review, get uh, four different traces on the screen with different modes and things. Then if you do clear right, then it just gives you a short description, exactly the same as what's in the manual pretty much. Uh, I like that it gives the skippy command, but once again, that's exactly copied from the Rigol. There's the same uh, clear right in the Rigol with the skippy command and yeah. <laughs> That uh, trace function, though, by the way, it works absolutely identical uh, functionality between the two here, except the menu is uh, a little bit uh, different. You have to go into a second submenu here on the Rigol, whereas it's all here on the uh, Siglent, so a little bit easier to use. But the functionality is exactly the same, except, uh, as we saw before, we've actually got four traces instead of uh, three on the Rigol. So that's it's a little bit nicer on the Siglent. But identical functionality which is great once again from moving from one scope to the other if you, you know, it's just if you if you've learnt one you know how to use the other practically instantly and if we hit the mode button here we can actually get a uh, reflection measurement option oops something's disconnect the dot oh no disconnect the device under test there we are warning adc overload oops um yeah i had a problem there. Don't do that. <gasps> anyway, um, yes, this is a uh, paid option for the thing, but I've got a trial license installed, uh, so you can actually get time trial licenses, and you can do reflection measurement. Let's give it a go. I won't fully demo this. I'll just have a very quick play around. We can, uh, from our tracking gen here, we can just uh, measure uh, any reflections on our cable. So I've got a little T-piece in here, and if we whack in just a little barrel joiner like that. Oops, something's starting to go horribly wrong there. And if we just whack in an unterminated cable into that, oh, look at that. Horrible. Now we can fix that all up again. Just whack our terminator on there and uh, Bob's your uncle. That's a nice, fun, very useful option for doing uh, reflection system measurement and things like that. But you've got to pay extra for it. Fair bit. I think it's like 500 bucks or something. If you go into the file menu here, you can uh, dump stuff, put in a USB uh, key, of course. But look, you can only save bitmaps. That's the only type. No PNG. Are you kidding me? What decade is this? And for those playing along at home, we can go into the system here and we can go into system info and there's the uh, various hardware uh, versions and everything else which I've been playing around with. And as you can see, I've got uh, the reflection measurement uh, one turned on. I've got the EMI uh, pre-compliance stuff turned on very handy. One of the uh, key uses for uh, like a low cost spectrum analyzer this is to do cheap pre-compliance because if you want to send if you're designing a product and you send it to a test lab for pre-compliance can cost you many many thousands of dollars so it's cheaper just to buy a uh, a spectrum analyzer like this a low cost one with an EMI uh, test set and you can do pre-compliance test your product before and have confidence that you're going to pass before you send it to a test house so that's an extra cost option I think it's like well, four or five hundred bucks or something but to try those out you can enable a free trial here so I've only got 12 hours left goodness but yes we can uh, load options here and whack in the license key and we can upgrade everything I believe we can upgrade to the 3.2 gig because this hardware I believe has the full 3.2 gig bandwidth in here so ooh, if you can hack this baby and get it for 1500 bucks it is the bargain of the century and of course, we've got a ton more functionality on this that 
you know, I really don't have the time today to spend to do it. We've got limit functionality we haven't uh, touched on. We've got uh, demodulation, of course, which we've got our modulation output here. So, you know, if we picked it, put an antenna on it, we can pick up an FM signal and demodulate it, do whatever. So you can get AM or FM uh, demodulation. You can turn the earphone, uh, the, well, the, you know, the headphone jack output, the demodulation time. You can set all that sort of stuff so you can demodulate signals. No worries whatsoever. And we've got coupling and we've got all the different types of uh, measurements that we uh, you know I could spend like I could do a video uh, explaining and demoing um, each one and I have to call this review quits and edit the video and get it up at some point but hopefully um, if you want to you know, if you want me to demo something like this, maybe I can get it back uh, from uh, Charles because he's just down the road here. So hopefully, um, if it's available, I can get it again and we can have another play around with it because I want to do a teardown of this puppy tomorrow. So yes, I violated my rule. I turned it on instead of taking it apart. And there's various other uh, file save types, of course. We can do bitmap CSVs and we can export data and do a whole ton of stuff. Spectrum analyzers are complex beasts and uh, they've got a ton of functionality in, in there, especially with the modern ones with all their measurement capability and things like that. You know, it's just mind boggling. And what you get for uh, what is it, uh, just over $1,700 here with the tracking gen because that's an absolute no brainer. If you're going to buy this, just shell out the extra 170 bucks for the tracking gen. Absolute no question whatsoever. It allows you to test filters and do all sorts of uh, fantastic stuff. So, well worth getting that. So I hope you found this video interesting, comparing the Rigol DSA815 to the Siglent SSA3000X. And do you want my opinion? Haven't been playing with it that long, um, but the Siglent, much better bang per buck. Even, I think there might be a couple of software bugs I've encountered, but generally its response is very fast. It's faster than the Rigol here, but even with bugs which you'd expect, in a product which has just come out. I mean, the Rigol has been on the market for a couple of years and it's a more mature product. So if you want better stability in operational firmware, the Rigol is probably going to do it. I'd expect a few bugs early on in the release of the Rigol, especially in such a complex uh, beast like this, but hopefully they'll fix those. They've been fairly responsive to uh, bug requests and bug fixes lately and things like that. So this one, I think the Siglent, much better bang per buck if I was spending my money I'd be buying this one, even with, uh, you know, a few little quirks and problems at this stage. Just the better noise floor, the resolution bandwidth, 10 hertz compared to 100 hertz, order of magnitude difference, so useful. The much better clock inside this thing, much cleaner. It's just a more powerful and useful instrument. So it's got a, it's worth the couple of hundred bucks extra on the Rigol. But yeah, we'll see as people start to use these things, we'll see how many quirks there are in the firmware, if there's any other issues or performance problems and things like that. And as we saw that uh, spike has to be investigated internal uh, coupling or something like that. But anyway, we'll see what we see. Once this thing gets out there, more people get to use it. Uh, go on the EEV blog forum. There's already a few users on there who have actually used this thing and done some performance uh, measurements and things like that, which is a really huge value of the forum. The EEV blog forum, by far the best test and measurement uh, forum on the net, no doubt about it. Lots of users putting this through its paces as people get their hot little hands on this. But anyway, if you want to discuss it, EV blog forum dedicated link down below and as always if you liked it please give it a big thumbs up if you want me to do anything else with it if I can uh, get it I should be able to get my hands on one occasionally again so if you want me to do any more uh, tests and things like that let me know hope you enjoyed it catch you next time so I thought I'd do a quick video showing you how to do some rudimentary pre-compliance testing with one of these uh, line impedance stabilization networks or listens um, and a, a cheap bottom of the range Rigol uh, DSA815 spectrum analyzer compliance but the other one fewer people know about is uh, conductive emissions and many products will have to be tested for conductive emissions as well and this is what we'll cover today